Welcome, everyone, to the Change Starts Here podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. In this week's episode, we welcome Mark Murphy, who is a co-author of The Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias, How to Reframe Bias, Cultivate Connection, and Create High-Performing Teams. Mark has been a senior consultant with Franklin Covey for about 30 years, and he's, you'll see quickly, he's one of the more genuine people you'll come across. Uh, we dive into his own personal story and struggles in life in this, and we talk about ways that uh, we can create stronger connections with people around us, stronger trust in our organization. Then we dive into how do we get better performance through celebrating our differences versus tampering our differences down. This is a great conversation if you're someone who wants to learn more about how to lean into people who are different than you. We dive into the idea of curiosity and empathy. Those are words that I think we all know well, but put them together and focusing on them and the way he teaches is something that I think is pretty profound and one that will help all of us. Um, I challenge him a little bit on how do we create connections with people that we have no understanding or interest in. And I feel like his answer there was really, really profound and really simple, but also really profound. This is a great conversation. You know, I keep saying that I probably say it too much, but I feel incredibly fortunate people we're having on consistently be folks that are, are consistently folks that are really passionate about their subject matter, very genuine, thoughtful people who, as we always talk about here at Change Starts Here, is about looking in the mirror before we're looking at others for change. And so they're just folks who look in the mirror to think about how can I get better to have more impact and influence in this world. And Mark is absolutely one of those people. It's a great conversation. As always, if you're a subscriber, thank you so much. If you are not a subscriber, please subscribe. And as you listen to this conversation, if there's someone that pops into your heart or your mind that you think needs to hear this conversation and learn more about Mark's thoughts and Mark's work, that would be great. Just send it to him. We thank you for all your support. Thank you for being a loyal listener and enjoy this conversation. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited to talk to you. Me too. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we've talked, you know, the first question is the same. Who are you and what do you love about what you do? Who am I? I'm a person that's amazed I got where I got today. Um, my goals in life kind of shifted with some experiences and I've had the pleasure and the honor for 31 years of doing what I do and what I have passion for. And um, it just, it makes me excited to get up and, and do my work every single day. So Mark, the what the audience knows is that you're an author of this great book, you're a consultant, you're a coach, you're a thought leader. What they don't know is you just talked about 31 years of impact that you've had here. How how did you, what, what is it that you've done for 31 years and how did you get to this spot? Interesting question with multiple parts to that. <clears throat> My kind of end in mind in going to, to college was to come out and do, um, to teach, mostly high school. I really wanted to be a high school teacher. I had done some little bit of substitute teaching, had an opportunity during one summer while I was back at home in Colorado and really wanted to expand on that. And so that was my end in mind. I had gotten my undergraduate in marketing with a minors in accounting, economics, and Spanish accounting and economics, because I hated each of those and knew if I didn't minor in them, I wouldn't pay enough attention to them to actually pass. So <laughs> minored in them, still barely passed, but got it. And then I came out, did work for a year and then got my master in organizational behavior mm. while with the intent of going into ultimately secondary education. And then I had used a Franklin planner all through graduate school. And so I grew up in Colorado. So I was back in Colorado working and a buddy of mine called me up and said, I, I was going to Utah skiing. And he said, Mark, if you're going to Utah, you need to ask this friend out. She works at Franklin. You use a Franklin. Made in heaven. So I <laughs> called her up, set up a date. Got up there, skied Thursday, Friday, came in Friday afternoon. There was a message. She was going to be late. She'd have her boss drop her off. Came in that night. <clears throat> excuse me. Turns out she was the executive assistant to the senior vice president of sales and training at Franklin International Institute at the time. Oh, wow. He sat down and started talking and basically ended up staying most of the evening which was the last date Sue and I ever had. Yep. That was on a Friday night. I was supposed to go back to Denver on Sunday. He asked me to stay for a couple of extra days. And by the next Wednesday, I had decided to give notice to the company I had been working for and started to work for Franklin Gotti. And that was 31 years ago. What what was it or what is it? You know, I, I guess it's two parts. Like, what was it about Franklin Covey that drew you there or Franklin, you know, international at this point? And then right. what's kept you here all these years? What's the... What, that's that's rare, right? There's a lot of folks that come and go, but to be somewhere for 31 years making more and more impact is refreshing to see, but it's not often we see that anymore. 
in all honesty, I, I was happy what I was doing. I was kind of in the interim of finding a, a secondary education. I was doing cross-cultural consulting expatriate training for this small company and was happy there. And he was talking about opportunity and what they were looking for. And I was young. You know, I, I didn't have any experience. And I thought, well, this is something I really wouldn't be qualified for, probably. And then he pulled out a list and said, well, this is what our consultants are currently making. And I was like, well, wait a minute. We might have a conversation here. <laughs> Honestly, that's how it started. And then as I begin to grow in my career, yeah, I, I often people ask me 31 years teaching the same thing over and over again. Don't you get bored with that? Yeah. And honestly, no. I don't view myself as a facilitator, consultant, trainer, which is the labels that I put on me. I actually view myself as a knowledge partner because I don't think there's ever a workshop I've facilitated where I didn't learn something from them as well. And so just that constant learning over 31 years and changing and adapting and growing in the content, the way we develop it, the way we present it, how we add in virtual and technology. And when, when I started, there was, I mean, my freshman year of college is when the first Mac came out and it was basically a, you know, a, a floppy disk word processor. There was no cell phone or any of that. <laughs> You're and, aging yourself. I, I wasn't going to go there because you look incredibly young. So I wasn't going to say anything <laughs> about that, but okay. It, it, it is what it is. <laughs> As we move in evolution of how we facilitate and what we teach and how we can reach people in the different ways of doing that and the modalities, I just find it constantly interesting. And so that's how I've lasted 31 years. So I wasn't planning to, to go down this path, but for being a consultant for 31 years and looking at yourself, not as just the facilitator, but as someone who's learning and not like we're learning with your groups. So many of the leaders who are listening to this podcast are folks who have to facilitate uh, trainings of different groups within their districts or schools at any given time. What are some of those tips that you could give them to better facilitate to where it's not them just talking, but it's side by side knowledge gathering? I think that's what facilitating is. Training is talking. That's just teaching somebody how to do things. Facilitating. The mindset I go into it with is that my job is to fac facilitate conversation amongst them so they can learn from and with each other. It's not to be the sage from the stage and tell everybody all the stuff that I know in helping them to learn for themselves and how it applies in their specific space is challenging, frightening, scary. Uh, it creates vulnerability, putting yourself out there, but it's also hugely rewarding and fun as can be. Yeah. Um, so during that 31 years, at some point uh, towards the tail end of that 31 you get a call to say, you know, I, we'd be interested in having you be a co-author of a book. And that book is a phenomenal book. For those of you who haven't listened, and I talked about it a little bit in the intro, but it's called The Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias, How to Reframe Bias to Cultivate Connection, Create High-Performing Teams. What impact have you seen uh, from this book or from the trainings that's come from this book that have been really encouraging to you? Let me tell you first how I ended up being an author, which was never my intent. I can barely write an email. So writing a book just really kind of blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had, this was several, a few years ago before the book, even if I was still in concept and I was not even aware of it, I had answered an email from our Australia office and it had a link to it. And so I clicked on the link and it turns out it was not from our Australia office. It was from our internal IT department sending out phishing emails. I got caught on. So they sent me to email jail. I had to go through all the training, security training, et cetera. And right after that, I'm boarding a flight and I get an email from our chief marketing officer. It says, all I said was, Mark, this is Scott. Give me a call with a link to his phone number. I thought, I am not falling for this again. <laughs> so I emailed back. If you really need to talk, you can call me. Well, it was him. And it was an invitation to be an author on the book, a co-author with Pamela Fuller, who's the main author, a colleague of mine, and then Ann Chow, who's on our board of directors, this was the CEO of AT&T Business. And so just being able to work with them, one, was huge. Hmm. And it's the impact that it's had on me through others is, and if you, you read the book, you know, I tell my story, I'm gay. Yep. And um, for me to be able to, to tell a little bit about my story and how it's impacted me and have it possibly help others. I find it an honor to be in a space that for something that for years and years of my life, I was petrified of, I did scared me. I was, I didn't want to share with anybody. I was scared that I would be rejected by all. It took me probably 
15 years at Franklin Covey before I came, came out to my team here, which is a story in itself. You know, I'd been right. working with them for 15 years. We're at Top Golf, and I don't know why I decided that's the night I need to tell them. And I just kind of blurted it out to them. I'm gay. And they all kind of looked at me and said, yeah, we kind of figured that. <laughs> I, was, I was deflated. I wanted drama, you know, and that, that's <laughs> all I got. But honestly, that's the first time in my career that I really felt like I belonged, that I truly started to engage because I could be me and bring all of me to the workplace. And to allow other people to be comfortable enough in themselves to possibly do the same is a huge honor. So that's the question I have is that, you know, you've been here 31 years, let's say half that time, you felt like there was part of you that you couldn't, you couldn't bring your full self, right? Mm -hmm. And you have this moment, and you come out to your team, and your team's like, cool, yeah, we know, we love you, keep moving. For them, they're like, hey, we love you. And I'm sure that like, we're trying to like honor you by just saying, look, we're good. Let's keep moving. How, how is that transition for you to be fully like to, to have the, the monkey off your back, I guess, in a way to where you could fully be yourself? How long did that take even from that point? It was immediate. Mm. Honestly, it was immediate that I felt like I could put pictures up of me and a partner that I never thought I could share. I could, when people are talking about, you know, their, their spouse or, or family or things like that. I had stories to share now that immediately I felt like now I belong and I can, I can be all of me. And there's, I don't have to worry about the words I use or the stories I tell. And it, it made a huge difference in engagement. I mean, that's powerful. And that's something that, um, you know, there's different leadership philosophies, but uh, one that I love is that I want everyone. And I know that one's one that you talked about and you're a thought leader on is bring your true self. And that's how you get the best performance. Can you talk a little bit about the performance zones that you guys break down in your book of, you know, from the damaging to limiting to performance zone that happens within a culture? Sure. I mean, we, we have what's called the impact of behaviors model. The idea that, you know, Talking about bias and the importance of that, it, it's relevant, it's timely, it, it's ethical, it's moral, it's all those things. There's also an, a profound impact on performance. Bias influences behavior, behavior impacts results. And so there are people that feel like they're being put in the damaging zone where they're slighted, harassed, or even abused, or a little bit better is the limiting zone where they're ignored or at best tolerated. But really where people excel is in what we call the high performance zone, where they feel included, valued, and respected. And that's the place, it, it's key because it's where people engage. We, we can't make people engage. All we can do is create a space of psychological safety, of belonging, of awareness where people want to engage. You know, you can buy the back and the mind. You can't buy the heart and the spirit. That has to be volunteered. And that's all founded on trust. People aren't going to engage unless they feel like they can, there's a, a psychologically safe place that they can trust to do that. You know, diversity is not just a nice thing to have in performance. It's requisite. If you want to be competitive, innovative, creative, there has to be multiple ways of looking at things, different ideas, different backgrounds. You know, Dr. Kevy used to say, if there's two people in the room and they both have the same idea, one of them's irrelevant. Yep. It's only when there's differences. It's not your way or my way, but a better way, a higher way that I wouldn't have come up without your ideas and you could have never thought of without mine. But together, we create something different and better. I also think that in that high performance zone is the only place people are going to truly engage every day in the mission, vision, and values of the organization is when they really feel like they belong. That's key. I'm sure you've been challenged. So there's a couple of things I want to challenge. So one is, and I was starting to go there, but I wanted to, you to preface it with these, these different zones. But there, there are folks out there who lead, who believe, leave your personal stuff at home, come here and bring your work. So why are we even talking about these things? What's your response to those leaders? I'm curious if you've come across those leaders much because I have. And what's your response when they say, we don't need to get into those kind of conversations. We're here just to work. The spectrum of what I usually encounter is there are some organizations and people who are just doing any kind of unconscious bias training to check a box. It's just Legally, we need to do this. So we've said, we can say we've done it. Most of the organizations I work with truly do want to change culture, see the value in it and make sure that their culture reflects that value of that. I, as much as you talk about separating the two, I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible. Nope. You can't, you know, what happens at work you take home. It, I think it'd be hard to be stressed, um, but, you know, dealing with deadlines, the exhausted and at the end of the day, turn it all around and be, you know, happy, fulfilling, kind, considerate, courteous with your family. 
doesn't work that way. And I, just the same way, I don't think you can have a, a family life in strife all the time and get to work and be productive. Yep. There, there is carryover there. No, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, my wife this week's had a, a, a tough week at work with different things that have happened. And I just see like, she does a great job of being gracious coming home, but you can feel the weight on her shoulders as she comes home from that burden. And so I feel like our job when she's home is to pick her up so she can get back into that fight. But to your point, like if you go home where it's it's the opposite, where it's tough at home, it's tough to get, if you're not being picked up, it's tough to get back in the fight at work, right? It's, it's just, it's a cycle. And so I, I love the fact that you see that as one and the same. It's the whole person that we need to bring to get the best performance, right? Exactly. And so the other question I have, I, I too am like you, I, I like and crave different points of opinion, like different different opinions. I love devil's advocates. I love finding folks that just see a complete opposite of me to get to the right result. But where that can be a challenge is how do you find, how do you not get lost in too much dissent? Meaning like at some point, a decision has to be made. And so there is going to have to be a decision made that may lean to one person's opinion over another. And people are going to have to get in line. How, how do you how do you mix that with really encouraging people to bring their full self and bring their full opinions? I think it starts with trust. If you have a culture of trust where people trust each other and they feel they, they engage, you can have discourse. And at the end, people know that whatever decision was made wasn't based on some set of criteria that's nebulous, ambiguous, that they don't understand that could be biased, that it was made from the best decision of everything brought to the table because they've had a voice in that conversation. I don't think people always have to be right. They just want to be heard in some way. Yep. Uh, when we talked uh, a week ago or a few days ago, we we talked about some of the conversations I've been hearing from superintendents as I've traveled the country is this passion for creating a culture of belonging within their schools and their school system. Can you tell me when you hear that, what, is, what does it mean to you to hear about a culture of belonging? How would you describe that? A place that... that connects both empathy and curiosity as a foundation. Empathy, it's, it's like two sides of the same coin. Empathy is the emotional side. Curiosity is the intellectual side. Mm. And I think the more that we have empathy for somebody, the more we try and put ourselves in their shoes, not just see the world through their lens, but feel it as well and truly understand it, the more curious we become. The more questions we ask, the more we get answered, the more empathy we can have. And it self-perpetuates as a part of that process. If you don't have empathy or curiosity, there is no connection. You just disengage. If it's all curiosity, I think you have a rational understanding of the situation with no emotional component to really connect you. And if you're on the receiving end of a whole bunch of questions with no empathy, it can seem like an interrogation. <laughs> But on the other hand, if it's all empathy, you have an emotional understanding with no rational understanding of what's actually happening in the situation. And so it's a connection of both. Too much curiosity is all about me. Too much empathy is all about them. But when you put those together in a balance, it creates a connection that allows people to move forward and create amazing things. What are, I mean, I, I love that. I think, you know, my, my mother-in-law and I are very close, but early on, she's someone who is very curious and sometimes would skip the empathetic questions. And so she would ask me about a thousand questions about something that's going on. I'm thinking, are, do you care about me or you just want to know the information for the information? Now I know her incredible heart and know that like, that's how she processes, right? Whereas I probably am too much on the empathetic side and may not be as curious enough on the details that I need to be. How, how do you help people develop or sharpen both, right? Because I think, you know, as people were probably drawn to one side or the other, more firmly. And so how do we grow in the area that we're not naturally drawn toward? I think that the fear for a lot of people is just how do I have a conversation where I get to know somebody that I don't know well, and I'd like to, but I, there's what if I, the fear I think for people is what, what if, what if I use a wrong term? What if I offend them in some way? What if I say something wrong or cross a boundary? Mm. And so I think it's, it's, you know, these are basically difficult conversations and creating a space and a place where you can have difficult conversations is about creating an emotional space that's safe about being curious, but at the same time, it, it's, it's that idea of really seeking to understand, not just to reply. For me, I know in my, in my mind, I have a hard time because if I, if I really listen intently to somebody in my mind, it implies I agree with you. And I don't think that's it at all. I, I, can, I don't have to agree with the words you say, but if I can understand where you're coming from, and really get that, then together we can create something different, better than where we started. If I can listen without trying to change your mind or defend my position, but truly just understand where you're coming from, it creates that 
safety place that that culture that you're talking about yeah when i when i grew up i my um family was involved in politics and on both sides of the aisle from Democrat to Republican. And so I grew up just living in nuance. And so nuance for me is exactly what you're talking about there. I feel like at least what it seems like, you know, whether it's on social media or, you know, headlines in the news, nuance seems to be lost because someone could make a quote and there's no place for them to have nuance. How do we create that ability to bring your full self, right? Maybe say accidentally the wrong words, but to have a culture where we can grow with that and learn from it so that there's nuance of growing together. Cause that's something that I, I feel like uh, is lost or it's just, we're not seeing enough of right now. And I guess the nuance, I guess, is, 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 is that you saying that everything is, is polarized in society right now. There is no middle yes. ground for us to just listen to understand to learn without saying it's good or bad. If, if you don't think like me, then it's bad. If you think like me, it's good. Exactly. Exactly. That's a better way to say it. Thank you. Well, I mean, this keeps going back to a foundation of the importance of trust. You know, it, sometimes in, in interesting, we, we wanted, you know, you, you'd name the title of the book, uh, a leader's guide to unconscious bias, how to reframe bias, cultivate connection and, and create high performing teams. The three authors wanted to call it, but that's not what I meant. That's really the title we wanted to put in the book. And we got overridden because so often that's what you hear people say, well, that's not what I meant. Yeah. And so I, I think good intent only gets so far good with the best of intentions. You can really hurt somebody. But when, when I trust you well enough to know that you ask these questions out of that, you, you declare your intent. I know your motive, your motive is pure. It's not to judge me or to defend yourself, but to really understand it takes both parties to engage. But when that happens, and there's enough trust there to know in this relationship, because I know you well enough to know that you're not trying to do something nefarious in the conversation you truly want to understand, and you're willing to go as far as I am with the conversation and then stop there and not push me any further until I'm ready to share, it makes a huge difference. Well, to that point, I, I think one of the things I used to get teased about in college is that I would have all these different friends of different groups throughout campus and I'd bring them together thinking I've got these best people that got to know each other and then they wouldn't talk and they'd have nothing in common or no, how, no, no way to have connection. I was never able to figure out like I could try to fake it with them to drive connection, but what advice, what support do you give to organizations who are trying to create connections, right? Genuine connections. So we talk about curiosity and empathy and that's great, but like, how, how do we get them started? What are the steps to take to get them leaning into the power of this connection that you're talking about? Sounds like you're the one that needs to share that answer. You've got that one down. It sounds like, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it takes courage. And I think courage, we talk about courage, courage, effective courage can be careful or bold. And they're not mutually exclusive either. Careful courage is required when there's low risk or high safety. Bold courage is required when you have to make an immediate change to something. Something has to change right now. And they both have their strengths and their limitations. But ultimately, there's kind of four buckets of courage that, that you, can, you can lean into. One is the courage to identify. Just the idea that the courage, I think it is a courageous thing to see, to really look for and be aware of and see and name the, the biases within us and around us. The courage to cope. If you're on the receiving end of bias, it's no small deal. It can affect us emotionally, physically, spiritually, all different ways. And the biggest, I think, organizationally is the courage to ally, to be there with somebody else, to, to support them and help them in their need, and the courage to advocate. What do we do institutionally, organizationally, in the networks that we create, the support systems we create, how we support each other in the culture. We speak up. If we see something wrong, we be a, be a voice for somebody else when they need it. Those are the ways when, to find ways in organizations to create allyship and advocacy are the keys. Well, when we talked earlier this week, I, I, I found myself getting emotional about your own ally story. And because the power of an ally, like I think, all right, I could be an ally. I don't Do people really need me to be an ally? I don't know. You know, it's my privilege to think about like, all right, I guess they need an ally or, how, how important really is an ally? Can you, if, I mean, if it's okay here, I'd love for you to, to share that story again, just so people understand the power of being an ally and advocate. You bet. Um, 
So one, it was interesting but to preface it, you know, being an ally is about teaming up with others, offering support, being the mentor that somebody needs, you know, being the voice for somebody else. I was on a panel uh, a couple of years ago, maybe at this point, and it was on allyship. And we were talking about all of this, the importance of it in organizations, why it matters. And somebody in the audience said, you know, in our organization, we don't have allies. In my head, I'm thinking, okay, that's an interesting comment. You know, where's this going to go? But she followed it with no, in our organization, we have co-conspirators. Ally implies support from the sidelines. We get in the trenches with each other here. Mm. Now, that is a really cool way to look at that. When, when organizations can do that, um, my brother did it for me. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm gay. I grew up in a very military, very conservative family where being gay was not an option. Um, and I spent the first 33 years of my life trying to do everything I could to one, not be gay. I didn't want to be gay. And two, to hide it from anybody that was important to me. And in 1993, that'll also age me, I was 33 years old. And honestly, I, I don't know what happened. Um, I don't remember, but I was living in Richmond, Virginia at the time. My brother was here in Dallas, where I live now. And something happened, and I, and I realized this is not changing. And it put me in this deep depression. You know, it's like, Mark, this is who you are. And so I, I covered all the windows and blankets. I didn't come out for days, which put me into a deeper depression. Till I got to the point where I decided I wasn't going to live anymore. And I had it all planned out on how I was not going to live. And the night before, I thought I need to tell somebody before I do this. And so I called my brother. And it's interesting. Now, keep in mind, this is pre-cell phone. This is landline days. And he picked up the phone. And he said, Mark, I'm glad you called when you did. I just left to go camping, forgot something, ran upstairs to get it right when you called. What's up? And, and to me, that's pretty divine in itself. And I just kind of blurted it out. I said, Scott, I'm gay. He said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I'm Scott. I'm gay. He goes, you're not gay. I said, Scott, I'm gay. His next words changed my life. All he said was, Mark, do you need me to fly there or do you want to fly here? And I said, Scott, I need to fly there. And so I got on a plane, got in here late at night to Dallas. He picked me up at the airport and I asked him, what does Catherine think? That was his girlfriend at the time and then his wife. And he said to me, Mark, I don't know. That's not my place to tell her something like that. That's only yours. I just told you you're coming to visit. That's allyship. I think every one of us has the opportunity every day to be an ally in some way, a kind gesture, a word. We don't know what other people are going through. We don't know their stories. And when we can find everyday opportunities to ally with somebody without having to know what their story is, but just be there for them, we never know the difference it's going to make in somebody's life. And we wouldn't have this great book had your brother not been an ally and had all the impact that you've had for the last 31 years in the organizations you've got to work with. Before we get to our last four questions, one, first, thanks for being courageous enough to share that story. Two, when you think about, again, closing, think about the work that you're still doing here. What, what is, if someone's on the fence about trying to dive into the unconscious bias work, the leadership's guide to unconscious bias, what's your encouragement there of like, what, why should they lean in? What's the, what's the real uh, impact that uh, should encourage them to take a chance with this if they're not comfortable or not fully sure if they should engage with the work? I'd say just try it, see what it's like. I don't, if you look at just say strictly professional network, yeah. there's nothing wrong with having an homogenous network. The people you go to are advice that come to you, that mentor you, that you look for on projects, et cetera. But what opportunities are you missing out on by not having something more diverse? not seeing the world through a greater lens, not creating that synergy that we can create organizationally. Personally, I, I think it's, it's the same. I, my life is so much better because of the diversity in it. There is more that connects us than divides us. We so often focus on the mm -hmm. division, but not far below, you know, if you use an iceberg as, as an example, we tend to judge people on the 10% of the iceberg that's visible, what we can see about them when 90% of who they are and what's important to them is below that iceberg. And if we can take just a little time to make connections below that waterline, you'd see that we have so much more in common than we have apart. And that little bit of diversity based on all that commonality creates all kinds of depth, humanness, humanity, 
just in a personal life, but also greater opportunity professionally as well. I love that. Well, um, as you know, the last four questions that we close out with are really simple kind of rapid fire questions. And so the first one is, what's a habit or discipline that you use on a daily or weekly basis to help you be the best version of yourself? I, I have a mantra, be present in the moment. Plan for the future, be present in the moment. Yeah, I, I just, since you brought it up, I just turned 62 last week. <laughs> How am I getting thrown under the bus about an age thing? I just talked about, a. you <laughs> talked about a floppy disk in a year. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, so I was 62 uh, last Sunday. <laughs> and, it, it, you know, as, as you get older, your, your, your age, your body starts reminding you more and more of your, your mortality. And I just think it's so important to be present in the moment and live life and prepare for the future, but just live in the moment. Do you, I, I love that. I think that's that's something that everybody needs to to really think about. How what do you have any tricks that help you sometimes when you feel like your brain's going off somewhere and thinking about the future or thinking about the stress you have or just something? Like, what do you have any tricks to help you get back in the moment when you start drifting? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's hard, right? Like I just, I mean, I I love it. it, it it's difficult. Um, yeah. I think gratitude is huge. I really try and think about all the blessings I have. I could I could spend lots of time talking about what I don't have and what I wish I had and what's not right. In just a few minutes to me every day of a little bit of gratitude mm. and what I have for as simple as it may be in the moment, it's not what I totally want maybe, but what I have grounds me. And I know that sounds cliche, and but it works. I think if you have pets, spend time with your pets. And there's so many different ways that you can just really ground in the moment. Your kids, they live in the moment. Learn from that. That's awesome. Uh, all right. So uh, it can be a book. One of the questions we always ask, like, what's a book you've either read recently or throughout your life that you would want everyone else to check out? Uh, it doesn't have to be a book. It could be a podcast. It could be another way that you consume media. But uh, what is what is something that you'd recommend that you think other folks need to check out and learn from? There's this great book called The Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've heard about it. We might have talked about it a couple of times today. A little bit. Um, along, along those lines, I do love Patrick Lencioni's The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Mm. It's a short read. It's a parable. It makes sense. It's, it's common sense. And I love his, his um, TED Talks as well. Yep. I also love anything by Patricia Cornwall, a novel. She's a murder mystery novelist that writes from the perspective of a uh, medical examiner in Richmond, Virginia. And since that's where I used to live, she writes about things happening in Strawberry Street Cafe, where I used to go for brunch and all these things. So I've read all of her novels and I find those fascinating. Can you, do you find yourself being able to go back to Richmond after she's described it the way she does or without being paranoid? <laughs> yes. Well, I haven't been back to Richmond much anyway, but um, yeah. yeah, it's, <laughs> it, of, of what's still there. I, I left there in 1993 to move here to Dallas, but if it's still there, I've been back yeah. a few times and I still go back and visit it and love it just as much. That's awesome. All right. Uh, you know, you're in, we've talked about where you are uh, in Dallas. Uh, I'm not going to tell everybody where you live, but uh, when you're either walking the streets, when you're working out, when you're stuck in traffic, what's on your playlist? What, what type of music, what type of artists, what songs? It varies. Honestly, mostly it's K-Love on the radio, which is the classic 70s and 80s rock, which yeah. is my era. So I love that. If it's off a playlist, there's two extremes. I love and I listen to constantly still after all these years, the soundtrack to Moulin Rouge, my favorite movie of all time. I love what they've done with the songs and how they how they interpret them. Yeah. On the other end of that is I love Buddha Bar. It's okay. a whole series of chill house. And yeah. It all, all depends on what the traffic's like as to what I'm listening to in the car and what I need my mood to be. Well, the thing that we know is that there is always traffic in Dallas, Texas. I think we're, I'm is. confident in saying that. Um, all right, last question. Uh, you're someone who's a thought leader. You're constantly traveling around other leaders or organizational leaders or thought leaders. Um, what's one piece of advice that you've come across recently, you've read recently, you've heard recently about leadership or the courage to change? that you think other people really just need to take heart and listen to? It's redundant, but I'm going to go back to it. It was reinforced to me yesterday. I spoke at a um, ATD conference yesterday and the MC they had is somebody who kind of, he did improv in between the speakers and the different breakout rooms and stuff. And he reinforced to me the importance of living in the moment. 
Mm -hmm. You know, just there, there's, there's the, the old, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in any in, in kind of a brainstorming meeting where you have this great idea and the first thing somebody says is, yeah, that's good, but we don't have the budget or they won't approve it or it's illegal or there's always some, some reason why you can't do it because it's all that yeah, buts in life. There's all these yeah, but, and we use that, I think, as rationale for just kind of being stuck. Yep. I love the idea of yes and. You know, I said, you never stop a scene with a line, but you always add to what the person said before you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we can do this and this. And so trying to live my life by yes and every day and not yeah, but is huge. That's great. Well, this has been an awesome, you know, 40, 45 minutes. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have because I appreciate the insight you've given us, but I also appreciate you bringing your heart and just sharing your own experiences as well as, you know, your heartfelt advice and wisdom for all of us. We appreciate you very much, Mark. Thanks for making time for us. Thank you, Dustin. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Have a great day. You too. Please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, podcast on Apple or Spotify, and help us celebrate the beautiful, messy work of shaping human potential. Mm -hmm.